And you really want to... Yes, invent a story for myself. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowlane. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. We are now at episode 16 and this is Erica's choice so let's find out what she has in store for us. I have selected Wings of Desire from 1987 directed by Vim Vendors and written by Vim Vendors with Peter Hanke and Richard Reidinger. And it stars Bruno Gantz, Solvik Dolmartin, Otto Sander, and also famously Peter Falk. And I did want to note as well the beautiful cinematography by Henri Alacan. And a fun fact too, Claire Denis is again his assistant director as she was on Paris, Texas. Okay, tell us about the movie. Wings of Desire is about Berlin's immortal angels and one angel's desire to become human so he can experience sensory pleasures. Okay, so it opens with a perfect blending of sublime human achievement, poetry, and the most sublime, or one of the most sublime angelic qualities, flight with these fantastic aerial shots over the city of Berlin. And the German title of the film is The Sky Over Berlin. And so we're transported through the city rooftops, streets, down to the most human element of the city, its inhabitants. And we go from person to person. And what struck me was everyone's inner monologue is the worry, the trauma, the anxiety, the loneliness that they're feeling. And that becomes broken by a child's joy. But at the same time as we're going through this survey of these inhabitants, I don't feel that it's a depressing experience. How is that when everyone is reciting this litany of of sadness? I think the children that it depicts are one reason that it keeps from veering into complete melancholy and adult anxiety because it demonstrates immediately that the children can actually see the angels. They're the one part of the population, I assume, because of their purity and innocence and because their minds are not clouded by all of these adult worries, can see the other beings that are so radiantly pure. They have that sort of connection with them, so they're visible to the kids. And all the way down the line, every single child that responds to them is either with a beautiful smile or a look of wonder or curiosity. You never see, even with a child who is dealing with leg braces, for instance, in one particular scene, she has the most huge beaming smile of all. So the interaction with the children, I think, is what keeps it from veering completely into the world of adult melancholy right away. Is it also that we sense that the angels are our watchers and they, we learn quickly that they can provide comfort and empathy? And I, I think I sense that as well, that there's something deeper and warmer going on. How do they demonstrate that to you? What do you see them do? I remember so clearly the hand on the shoulder and the way the angels could tilt their heads closer into the humans to touch them as closely as they were able to, but to make that tactile connection. I was going to ask you about the listening thing, the tilting of the head, because obviously they are receiving these voices. The angels, as we see them move above the city, throughout the city, on public transportation, moving down sidewalks, they are receiving everyone's thoughts. At times, they're cacophonous because they're laid six and seven voices on top of each other. So is it not a function, the leaning in, the getting as close as possible, in addition to providing comfort? Did it feel to you like that was them making the effort to focus on pulling the one particular voice out of the din? I hadn't thought of that. I guess I took it the way that I wanted to, the way that I hoped it would be, that they were a close friend. So we have multiple examples in the opening of the film of this thing that you mentioned, where the angels are moving through the city, offering comfort and inspiration to a variety of people, most of whom are troubled in some way. 
there is a gentleman whose mother has just died and he is thinking rather selfishly about the hassle of the disposition of her belongings, waiting for his sister to come help with that. It's the same thing I'm thinking of for when my mother eventually dies, (laughs) about all the hoarding I'm going to have to go through. There is the woman in labor in the ambulance that sticks out to me. There's the gentleman who has bought a guitar for his son, and the son now also wants a set of drums, and he's just not ready for that. So it's established in this first 10 to 15 minutes of the film as we see these angels primarily observing and then occasionally dispensing comfort and helping people navigate their way through life's trials. Do you relate to these inner monologues? It's the one part of the film that I don't relate a great deal to. I was struck, and I put in my notes as I was watching, just how much apparently... And I don't know if this is true or not. I guess maybe it is. And that's why this is such a universally appealing film that everyone's inner monologue is so full of regret and doubt and disappointment. And similar to the way I don't relate to coming of age movies, because the way I did it is so different, apparently, from the way everyone else did it. I see these people feeling these things and I cannot relate. I cannot empathize exactly with them. I don't find myself sitting around worrying a great deal or doubting myself or having this fear or insecurity or lack of confidence. And so it makes it ring a little false for me because it's just not what I deal with every day. Or even down to the simple concern of how am I going to get this fridge and washing machine into this tiny apartment and the little boy on his own looking at other kids playing and wishing it were not just him, but it is just him. And he's singing a little song to himself. All of those sort of small things. None of these things are a problem. <laughs> when, I, when I see it, it doesn't... See... <laughs> Movie over. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. <laughs> but it's the one thing that puts a distance between me and the movie. Because I don't find myself sitting around when I'm on my own, in my own head, thinking about how afraid I am of something or how something might not work out. Are there things in it that you find relatable in what these people are going through? I'm not sure that any of them have been my exact personal experience, but I probably, well, most certainly more so than you, I do have a little inner monologue of concern going through the day, much less than I did when I was younger, certainly, but it's still there. So I can understand and empathize that others are probably doing the same. I can sympathize. I understand that people are going through it. It just never occurs to me to be the first thing to do. So it's not completely foreign as an idea. I understand people are struggling. I suppose my gut response to it is, well, there's a solution, so find it. I think I'm just not, maybe not that smart yet. I'm not that evolved <laughs> as a human yet to, to get there. Or just Sometimes not, I not am. Not that impatient, maybe. Maybe. What was the point when that distance that you had felt, that unrelatable distance, goes away? That happens primarily when you see the first time the angels are together and they're comparing notes. They're sitting in a Mercedes dealership. It is Germany after all. That's true. Comparing their notebooks and talking about the things that they observed throughout the day, which I get the impression that they do this together every day. It's a part of their daily ritual, it seems to me. And I really like the poetic nature, I guess, of the things that they pay attention to. When the inconsequential is rendered poetic. Exactly. I'm thinking of the hot air balloon that he remembers from 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. That was my favorite. Although I don't know that I would call that inconsequential. That would probably be... That's pretty amazing. That would be a a wonder of the age. But when when the age is an eternity, the age becomes slightly smaller, I guess. This scene is also the first point at which they express to me what is sort of the thesis statement of the film about how mortal life is a gift and the things that you and I think of as nuisances or petty details are extravagances to the people, to the beings, I should say, that cannot experience them. It's the first time that Bruno Ganz's character expresses a desire to experience these human feelings for himself. 
He says, no, I don't have to beget a child or plant a tree, but it would be rather nice coming home after a long day to feed the cat, like Philip Marlowe. <laughs> I, I loved that one in particular. That is a perfect example. And to lie through one's teeth. <laughs> and Cassiel, who is uh, played by Otto Sonder in the movie, he says... Yeah, to be able once in a while to enthuse for evil. But he's also cautioning him. He's saying, stay alone. Let things happen. Keep serious. Keep your distance. It's really the first significant portion of dialogue in the movie that the main characters exchange. And it's beautiful dialogue. It is. It's the first really fruitful part of the collaboration between Benders and Handke as they were slowly beginning to build this thing from Vender's notebook, this scene was the first one that they began to flesh out. And Vender's in particular mentions how much he loves the dialogue and how he doesn't consider himself a writer first and foremost. And he was at his most comfortable during the filming of this movie when he was filming scenes for which Hanka wrote the dialogue because it's so beautiful and he said he felt extremely safe any time he was filming Hanka's words. And Hanka wrote the poem that we begin with, Altstadt's Kind Kind War, which I have said to myself probably once a week since I saw the film the first time. I say it almost as a lullaby and it morphs into Van das Kind Kind War and goes on and on and on and it becomes this little waking lullaby. I find it intensely comforting. <laughs> What is it in particular you think that strikes you that way? I don't know if it's the melody that the German sounds make, Van das Kind Kind war. the way a sentence is structured in German, that you flip the clause. Hmm. There's I don't just know. poetry I've, in I've it. Got, I've got nothing to explain it, but I, I say it to myself all the time. I can't emphasize that enough, how much I do that. Am I starting to get crazy eyes a little bit when I say that, when no, you're looking at me? I can see how sincerely you're moved by this thing. So we move from this beautiful exchange of dialogue then into one of my favorite sets in the whole film, the library. Don't you want a table full of lighted globes <laughs> I do. in your I house? Love that table. It's beautiful. It's a gorgeous library. The ceiling is amazing. All of the floors... And we have, again, the angel's point of view as we're scanning through the people reading. And we see that there are more angels than just the two that we have been living with so far. And this is where we first meet our storyteller, Homer, played by Kurt Boyce. And I could be pronouncing his last name incorrectly. I apologize, Kurt. And he was one of the first child actors, actually, in the world. He first appeared in a silent film in the teens. Hmm. And he was an actor in Germany for many, 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 many years. I know him from Casablanca is where I know him from. First and foremost, anyway. I didn't realize he basically started as a child with the inception of the film industry. Vinders tells a really funny story about how he would gently rib Kurt about being in Casablanca for five seconds. And Kurt would always correct him and tell him nine seconds. <laughs> And he is our storyteller. He is Homer. He is talking about his muse and his eternal story and what he has seen in Germany through the years as well. He was roughly 87 years old at this point. He actually died when he was 90, so shortly after this. And I think it's safe to say you see the weight of all of his years on his oh, tiny bent shoulders. Another funny little anecdote about him since Sonder was playing his guardian angel, essentially, he would occasionally do this thing at the end of a take as soon as Vendors yelled cut, where he would collapse to test him <laughs> to make sure he was constantly looking out for him. So <laughs> Sonder was always a little bit tense filming these scenes with him because potentially as soon as the scene was over, this almost 90-year-old man would drop to the floor to make sure that he was looking out for him all the time. Now that you say that, I feel like I'm. my idea was validated that it looks like Otto is sort of uh, has his arms open behind him as if he might, he's ready to catch him. He needed but to be. Maybe, maybe that was just my imagination or maybe it was uh, reality. What's German for trust fall? I don't know. Schaden plants kaput, maybe? <laughs> 
Don't yell at us on Twitter for that. <laughs> Sorry. And he is struggling to get up the stairs to the next level of the library. And he's finding certain books that will trigger memories. And this is when we start to see archival footage of war-torn Berlin. And Homer is the person that takes us out of the library into the city of Berlin from that ground level that we first have. And he is trying to find the now destroyed Potsdamer plots. And he takes us close to the wall and you see the wasteland sections of Berlin. And vendors had said that there was so much waste ground at the time that there was always a circus going on. And we see that in a moment. As we move from above the city to public transportation to library, now onto the street, into this no man's land, and eventually to the circus, I thought a lot about the conversation that we just had not too long ago about Slacker and how this film moves in a similar way, sort of passing the baton from character to character via angels in this case. And it allows us to experience Berlin the same way Slacker allows us to experience Austin, but with the added benefit of all of these interior monologues. It's a beautiful device, and it leads us to the circus, as we mentioned. And here our perception shifts again, because the world becomes color. We've entered the human world. There's no angel there at the moment. So we now realize another mystery has been revealed, that the angel world is black and white, because they're not able to sense that the human world is in color. And this is where we first meet Marion, who is our lonely trapeze artist. Marion works at the Circus Alacan, which is an homage to the cinematographer Henri Alacan, who also famously shot La Belle et la Bête. Which Americans would know as... Beauty and the Beast. By Jean Cocteau. Yes. One of our favorites. Tell me if you agree with this. Could you hear the melodic score of this film played over Beauty and the Beast? Oh, I kept imagining it. Absolutely. Especially just the choral pieces when all of the voices are swirling. I was thinking more of the piano work, actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I see both. all of it. Even Nick Cave. <laughs> True. Back at the circus, Marion is completing her act preparation and goes back into her trailer. And we shift back into that angel world of black and white because Damiel is there with her. And we see him for the second time reach out for an object to hold it he's able to hold i guess it's essence Mm -hmm. what do you think it is i think that's exactly what it is you see him do the same thing with a writing object in the library just again demonstrating his desire to interact and have these tactile human sensations that are not afforded to him something else you said made me think of essence i think what you mentioned briefly just a second ago about the black and white photography and what it's communicating how the angels can experience the full range of senses, I think it also has a lot to do with how they are strictly perceiving the essence of a thing, the essence of a person, the essence of a landscape. The black and white demonstrates that they are understanding it at its most basic essence. And we see him go to possibly touch Marion. And does that represent a major shift again? Another catalyst? What should I become? Can I become something other than what I am? Can I participate in this world? It's very pivotal, which is underlined by a thing that Peter Falk says to him much later in the film, after he renounces his angelic status. Spoiler alert. We'll get to that. But he thinks better of it, and that world shifts again back to color, indicating that he's no longer in the room with her as she's taking off her robe. As he leaves and goes almost immediately to a scene of a motorcycle accident. This is my absolute favorite scene in the movie. Why is that? For all sorts of reasons. It begins with the angel's point of view moving along the ground at the highest rate of speed that we have seen and will see again. There's the most urgency in this shot as he is crossing the bridge to get to the motorcyclist who is propped up against the back of the bridge and dying there on the street. I like it for that urgency, and you see, for I think the only time, the camera move away from either the point of view of the angels or the point of view of someone observing the angels. It becomes a completely separate device. 
Bruno Gans comes around and puts his hands on the dying man's head. He does an invocation, and then they begin to recite the litany of things that is this dying man's final thoughts, essentially. And while that's happening, you see the camera do a thing that it doesn't do any other time. It completely removes itself from the perspective of any of the participants, and you watch it move back and forth. That gentle swing. Right and left. You see it move over to one side, and you get the entire shot of the bridge, which, of course, highly symbolic, crossing over, all of those things. You swing back to the right as you see Damiel begin to interact with the dying man and begin his invocation, and they begin to speak in unison. It swings back again, and you see someone running up the bridge toward the scene of the accident that eventually is the mortal that takes Damiel's place in comforting the man. And as it swings back again, Damiel is released and he goes on his way because there is now nothing left for him to do. I love it because there's all sorts of room for interpretation in that camera motion. Even among the principals, Venders himself said he shot it that way for two main reasons. To show the pain that Damiel was going through, experiencing this in unison with this man, and also so you could literally get a better vantage point to see what Damiel was doing physically to provide comfort. Agnes Goddard, the assistant camera operator, who was actually the person physically moving the camera that day, she said to her it was much more about simulating the beating of a heart. Oh, that I never back thought of forth. that. And you can see it begin to slow as the scene progresses. Oh, wow. So even the people that were there on set that day had their own interpretation and motivation for what the camera was doing. And then that final release as mortal human being takes over because there's nothing more that an angel can do. A theme that we see reiterated a couple of times. Angels can't be everywhere. And sometimes humanity is just left on its own. It's my favorite scene in the whole thing because it demonstrates all of the great things about being alive, which includes death in some cases, and this really interesting and unique technical aspect that doesn't show up anywhere else in the movie. And how significant is it as well that their litany, their invocation, is a poem? It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's really significant because you see the imagery in it go from ruined things, the tanker that he references smelling like a tanker, to emergent, transcendent imagery of coming through the fog. As you run through the litany of things that they are mentioning, this series of images goes from very much ruined and earthbound to leaving all of that behind and transcending mortality and pain and whatever else might be associated with that feeling. So overall, to me, it's just a really great encapsulation of all of the conflicting elements of the logical versus the poetic and the abstract versus the concrete and how all of those things can come together and make something incredibly beautiful even in the midst of death. We're about to see another example of that. From the motorcycle scene, we move back into the city and we come upon Peter Falk again, and he is on the set of this film that he is making. So we've got the concrete and the abstract again, this art of filmmaking of an actual period of history. This time he is, what is it? He's a detective Mm -hmm. in Nazi Germany. This is the plot of this film that they're making. So it's almost a meta reference to the artifice of filmmaking in this very definite ruined city. And we see all of the day-to-day again, the inconsequential. He's trying to figure out which hat he should wear as this character. (laughs) We've got the extras that he's working with, his habit of sketching between scenes. And this is where Damiel comes upon him again. And he realizes that... Peter Falk can sense him, can sense that he's there. And so we get confirmation of this sixth sense that Peter Falk has later when he meets Damiel by a food truck. And they have this exchange, or at least as much of an exchange you can have with someone that you can't see or hear, in which Falk says, I can't see you, but I know you're there. And it clearly demonstrates to the audience that There's something different about how he perceives. He is somewhere between angel and child and regular human. Peter Falk is magical, which I... 100% believe. 100%. No doubt. I've always thought so. 
I assume this was the documentary portion of the film. <laughs> and he's telling he's telling Damiel how great life is. As a human being. Yes. As a mortal. Drinking a cup of coffee and talking and smoking a cigarette and how great it is to do those things together and just on and on and on. And you think he has a little bit of an agenda. I think he has a huge agenda. Which, again, is confirmed much later in the film when you find out that Peter Falk was an angel. Yes. I think he's trying to coax every single current angel over to the human side. Proselytizing for a... Because he knows how fantastic it is. He knows how much fun it is to draw a dark line and then a light line. And they make a great line together. Yes. And this sort of fellowship and the little things that, like I mentioned before, that to us we take for granted how much of a gift life and all the little things in it are. Nothing would make him happier than converting every single angel into a human being. And Damiel is obviously receptive to this. I think his decision is made when he goes to Marion's closing performance. Her circus is closing. And it's a performance for children who are delighted by the circus and actively participate in it and you can see the joy on his face as he watches what that would be like and i think the decision is made then that he's going to become a human and renounce his angelhood there's a brilliant move in that sequence where he again takes to the camera because at that point the camera is cassiel's point of view so it's as if he's looking to him to express some idea And what is happening is he's sitting in the bleachers with the kids and the kids are so excited that they cannot help but talk to him. Yes. Which they were not supposed to do. (laughs) But it seems perfect. It does. And at the very beginning of that scene, Bruno Gans turns to the camera and has this slightly amused smile as if to say, I know this isn't what's supposed to be happening, but I'm going with it. And it turns out to be the perfect decision. Then he and Cassiel are walking back through the streets And they're having this exchange about the beginnings of humanity, about rising from the swamp, about moving through the savannah and beginning to walk upright. How long they went, in fact, as observers before anything approaching their, what would be their recognizable form existed on the earth. Until there was a form of man that they could emulate. Mm -hmm. And how, for example... The shout of a Neanderthal, I guess, turned into a word. And what it would be like for Damiel to say, oh, or ah, or yeah, and where that would go. And then he says, yes, I'm going to invent this story for myself, the story of of becoming a human, my human story. Because he's no longer satisfied with strictly observing. It feels like observance is a form of absence. It's not direct participation And therefore, he just can't take that sort of existence anymore. It's not valid to him. Plus, Peter Fox has been using all of his (laughs) peer pressure, so what are you going to do? Be a human. All the cool kids are doing it. Yes. But before we see his fall, his literal fall, we see the suicide Mm -hmm. of a man as well that Cassiel was not able to prevent. Another scene that I really like, one of my favorite scenes in the whole thing, Because, again, the guy who is about to commit suicide to jump from this tall building is running through this list of things in his head that seems so inconsequential. And yet all of those things to him add up to existence is not worth it anymore. I think I like it so much because, again, it reiterates that notion that angels are not omnipresent. Angels cannot save humanity on their own without humanity's help. In much the same way that Cassiel couldn't prevent the suicide in the scene just prior to that, they make reference to the fact that there are just so few of them. There aren't enough angels to look out for the entirety of humanity. And in particular, in this case, as they're walking towards the wall, they make reference to panzer tracks and the war and all the destruction that had just happened 40 years prior, implying that, again, angels can't be everywhere. Angels can't be everywhere, but evidently they also have free will because Damiel decides to become a human once and for all. And he has his fall into humanity and wakes up in this no man's land, kind of, between East and West Berlin. This was two years before the wall came down. And it's interesting when you look at those 
representations of the wall, filming the wall was illegal. And so they had to actually build replicas. So that's not the actual wall that you're seeing. He wakes up and he is... He doesn't wake up. Oh. He is shocked awake by his armor falling on his head. Oh, that's right. Yes. And all, that's all that he has. That's all that he's left with. His sole possession. The most important thing of, of that whole sequence to me is when he reaches up and touches his head where the armor has fallen on him and he's bleeding. It's the very first on-screen indication of his humanity aside from the fact that everything's now in color. And it's interesting that you say that because the first thing that occurs to me from the humanity standpoint is the exchange that he has with his fellow human where he asks him if he needs any money. Now, this seems to be more vital. To, I mean, truly, in, at the most, according to Hoyle definition of the word vital, this aspect of it, and also what the film is trying to say, because he touches his head, sees it, and then tastes it. It is a literal oh, taste of right. life. Oh, that's right. And he says, it has a taste. Right. He is literally tasting life. It cannot be more symbolically significant. Nothing in the movie is more symbolically significant than that moment. Okay, I just got told. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> After that... After that, he has a wonderful brush with humanity. He's given a little bit of money to help him keep going, but he needs more money, and so he decides to pawn his armor, which Peter Falk tells him a few moments later when they catch up together that he got robbed, basically. He should have gotten way more money for it. Right. He did get a sweet sort of sweater crocheted sweater out That's of the nice deal jacket. with the hat yeah falk got five hundred dollars for his and those years were ago five dollars yeah this is when we realize for sure peter falk used to be an angel mm -hmm. he reveals that to us and to Domiel. and this is the scene in which peter falk says the thing that i mentioned a little while ago in the show and that thing is in response to when Domiel tells him what his plans are he asks what Domiel is going to do and he says well there's this girl to which Peter Falk's response is, ah, good, a girl. It's perfect. It's earthy and funny and human and the most basic motivation that one human being can feel toward another. When Damiel realizes that Peter Falk used to be an angel, he says, I want to know everything. Mm -hmm. Tell me everything. And Peter Falk says, you have to figure it out for yourself. That's the best part. Yeah, you don't want to miss out on the fun. It can't strictly be an academic exercise. Again, referring to our slacker conversation we had when we watched It's Impossible to Learn to Plow by Reading Books. It's true. Same principle. Can't learn about girls from hearing it from somebody else, cousins aside. <laughs> Damiel then proceeds forth. Wandering through the city, he is led to the poster for the Nick Cave concert, as Marion has been led there as well. These two points coming together inexorably. And I love how he's just trying to experience little things, too, as he's making his way around the city. The feeling of a warm drink in his hands on a cold day. Even something as simple as running down the block so he can feel winded, which is a feeling he's never experienced before. In between trying to track down this human woman that he has, at least to a small degree, made this enormous leap for. They are at this Nick Cave concert. Damiel is in the bar. Marion comes into the bar and finds him. And they, I don't know what to say, commune? She realizes she's been waiting for him. She had a dream, in fact, just the night before. He in his armor, which was looking pretty good, by the way. <laughs> and he leans into her. And on this viewing, what stayed with me was his jawbone and profile as he's leaning into her neck. And this time, I could smell him. And you know what he smells like? What's that? He smells like that Dr. Robinson's tonsorial unguent that you use, <laughs> whatever it is. That's what he smelled like to me. It's well, pr pretty sexy. What are you talking My In the shaving mug? Yeah. What's that stuff called? That's. Do you know how old that is? That's my great-grandfather's shaving mug that I use. And it's still the same. His very last disc of soap shaving soap that was in it that's what that is i want to say i don't remember now what he used but that soap is at least 40 years old 
That's and as the movie almost is thirty years next year, that's what Damiel smells like to me. You think the Turkish barber he went to had the same I think so. soap that my great grandfather so. used? Did your grandpa take it back from nineteen dickety two? Could be. Okay. Anyway, so they are communing. They are together. And we finish with the scene of Damiel assisting Marion in her new act. He's elevating her. He's helping her to fly as he's on the ground. And the way you responded to the scene in the bar when they meet as human beings for the first time, I think I responded the same way to the monologue that actually, I guess, turned out to be a diary entry that he was reciting as he was helping her perform her act, her aerial act talking about how they became one for the first time how she enveloped him and he was inside her and how their spirits mingled and what a poetic description it was of their first night together i thought was really beautiful which then ends with that last line he writes in the diary i know now what no angel knows then to be continued so curtain comes down house lights come up what is it that you are left with after watching this? Why is it that this resonates with you and made you choose it for the podcast? I think back to the first time I watched it in my small apartment with a close friend in the mid-90s. And it was a transporting experience for me. I had mentioned earlier what stayed with me was the comforting hand and the empathy and the feeling that the angels leaning their heads in more closely to hear or to communicate. It was my first introduction, I think, at that point to what is essentially a visual poem. Mm -hmm. I had also mentioned that I repeat that lullaby in my head constantly and have for decades now. I remember the laugh that sprang from my friend and I when we realized that Peter Falk was an angel. There was so much delight in mm -hmm. that feeling. I could relate at that time to Marion Marian saying, I've waited an eternity for someone to say a loving word to me. And now I've got the distance of 20 years and those things that made me smile and feel deeply, I still, I still feel the same. And now even more so that I can smell Bruno Gonza's jawline. <laughs> It's even more beautiful and earthy and pleasurable. And in reading through some material to prepare for this, I found some words from Roger Ebert, where he was saying in his original review that Wings of Desire is one of those films movie critics are accused of liking because it's esoteric and difficult. I had the exact opposite reaction yeah, to seems... the film as a 20-year-old and now as a 40-year-old I can't understand that. I can't understand anyone ever feeling like that. It was so immediate and still is. Yeah, it's completely accessible. If you want vendors that's hard to find a way into, maybe watch The Goalie's Anxiety at the Penalty Kick or something like that. This, to me, plays almost just a notch below something for a mainstream audience. It is not complicated. It's still very subtle and rich, but it is not at all problematic or thorny to try to find a way into. And so the opposite point of view to that is what I think now most people accept. It is so accessible that it's practically all things to all people. Mm -hmm. It's a movie for the ages. And again, in something else that I was reading, I wanted to ask you this question. Okay. I read something I really enjoyed about this film. Michael Atkinson, he's a film critic and essayist, said, This film has beguiled the vendor's aficionado as reliably as it's absorbed the spiritually hungry civilian, the rogue film head, the bookish square, and the non-denominational seeker. So which one were you when you watched this film? Non-denominational for sure. What were the other choices? <laughs> the rogue film head. That's probably more like it. Yeah. The bookish square, the spiritually mm. hungry civilian. No, not in that. Not the spiritually hungry civilian. The other three things, at least some combination of parts of them. I think for me as well, I, I might even say I'll combine some and say the rogue civilian. How about that? Okay. That's how I felt when I saw it. That all things to all people part that you mentioned, that 
very definitely feels like Vim Vendors to me. And more specifically, the space that he occupies as part of the new German cinema movement of the late 60s and 70s. I always thought, and we had this conversation a little bit last night, that out of all of those people, Fassbender, Herzog, Vendors, uh, Schlondorf, that Vendors would be far and away your favorite, it seemed like to me, because of how poetic and how romantic everything is. If you look back at the history of the show... True. <laughs> you can see that that is right up your alley, where yeah. Herzog is far and away mine. I do love Vim Vendors and Fassbender, Schlondorf to a lesser degree, but Herzog is far and away my favorite just because of the titanic struggle, man against nature, all of these themes that he is obsessed with and goes to such great lengths to put on film. Whereas Vendors seemed to me much more the choice that you would make. Am I close? I'm not sure. I As I answer all of these questions, I have to think about 50 different clarifiers and clauses. So this was my first Vim Vendors film. Okay. And was my only Vim Vendors film for a very long time, up until very recently, actually. So I watched this several times, but in that huge, vast meantime, I watched so much more Herzog. And I guess I can't overstate how much I love My Best Fiend. <laughs> and when I think of collected works against collected works, mm -hmm. I would probably still put Herzog above hmm. because you know I'm obsessed with Tales of Survival. Yeah. You know I'm obsessed with his speaking voice. <laughs> right. I think maybe he edges it out a little bit, but if you take a single film versus a single film, I think probably Wings of Desire. Okay. Though now, based on the retrospective that we got a chance to see at Austin Film Society, Alice in the Cities is there now. Paris, Texas there. Is, now, is there now. Speaking of Paris, Texas, I think about it coming three years before this film. And those parallels, how you get from that film to this film. Thematically, production-wise, ideas, main characters. This whole part of Vendor's career is probably the most interesting part for me to see how he went from seven or eight years of being in America and making these travelogues and being, if not obsessed, very definitely fascinated by America and consumer culture and the wide open spaces, but then feeling that need to return home to make this. To feel that Germanness mm -hmm. again. He felt like even his command of the language, the German language, was kind of drifting away from him. And so this real desire to return to roots, you also see in this period all of the fantastic movies he made just prior to Wings of Desire with cinematographer Robbie Mueller and then worked with Henri Alacan on this instead because Robbie Mueller was making Barfly at the time and couldn't get away. And Henri Alacan was, was French and was not from Berlin, obviously, and vendors felt like he could bring this perspective of the city, make him see it in an entirely new light. And he did. And his technique compared to Mueller's technique, they are night and day. And I think some of it's very much a generational thing. Alakan, on the set of Wings of Desire, generated, much like he did on Beauty and the Beast, a very unreal atmosphere, which is perfect for this film. But he did things that Mueller would have never done. Mueller's entire technique was to take natural existing sources of light and then just amplify them. But Alakan would put lights where no lights should realistically be coming from and use them in a much more painterly way than Mueller ever would have. So it looked so different than this would have had they had Mueller and Vendors collaborated again. And I think about the black and white of... Kings of the Road, for example, mm -hmm. versus this black and white, and they're totally different. Oh, extremely. It's so sharp and gorgeous in this, where the soft black and white of the Road trilogy fits in perfectly. The black and white of this is sharp and gritty, highlighting what some people have called the crumminess of Berlin. That's interesting because it struck me the opposite way. When I look at the cinematography in the Road movies, everything is so suffused with sunlight so often that it just sort of highlights the barrenness of a lot of it but you feel i feel that 
in this, I can see every rock and every piece of garbage. And we travel through those huge wasteland sections of Berlin. And I can see every bit of grit and grime and even the contrast in the graffiti. It certainly hasn't been sugarcoated. Mm -hmm. It certainly hasn't been whitewashed or beautified. You can see every piece of rebar. And so the city really becomes a character, it feels like. Or it you... is. I think, as Vendors has said, he's using Berlin to represent the world because everything has happened there. Again, we see this archival footage at different points, and I can't recall another time where we see the effects of the perpetrators and those perpetrated upon. Mm -hmm. This is a city in flames, and we know why, and yet we're watching the civilian experience of it as well, which is a newer thing. Politically, the film takes place at a really interesting point, like we mentioned, two years before the wall came down. And we hear in one monologue of a gentleman who's driving around the city in his head talking about how each person has become their own state, how each person carries their state around with them. And it underlines essentially how each individual has become a small political entity unto themselves rather than just another human being relating to another human being. What are we meant to feel then? Is it a survey of discontent, of sadness? Is it existential to that extent? No, absolutely not. Ultimately, I think, and this ties back into why I would have chosen it for the show and why this is on my list of all-time favorites as well, I think ultimately what we are supposed to come away with is to be reminded that this life is a gift we have all been given not to take things for granted, and to embrace and really engage in life at every level, even the petty annoyances, even the squabbles and fights, all the difficult things, because they're inextricable from the good things. You can't just have all pleasure all the time. And the sum total of those things is what makes your life, and you have this great gift of having a story. Everyone has their story, which is all he aspires to, is to be able to have his own story. I think it's supposed to remind us how important that is. And we should never forget that one of the great joys of being alive, that as human beings, we can know what no angel knows. Now that our resident Arilka has wrapped up the episode so succinctly and beautifully... I think that that leads us to recommendations. Did Rilke ever drop a mic like that? Nope, he should have. <laughs> okay, for my recommendation, I am sticking with the daily lives of the citizens of Berlin. And I'm going to recommend a film called People on Sunday from 1930. It is a beautiful early German silent film that profiles a handful of young people in Berlin who are going for a weekend outing. And it's really fascinating because you get to see a look at Berlin in the period between world wars. So all of this destruction you see, for instance, in the newsreel footage in Wings of Desire, hasn't happened yet. Hitler hasn't come to power yet. And people are carefree. Although there's an eerie bit of unintended darkness in the final title card that talks about how these people now have to go back to their regular daily grind and they're just waiting, waiting, waiting for next Sunday. At the time, it didn't have this ominous ring to it. With the benefit of hindsight, there's a little layer of darkness in it now. And look at the pedigree on this thing. Directed by five people, different segments of it. Kurt and Robert Siodmak, Edgar Ulmer, Fred Zinneman, who directed Oklahoma and Man for All Seasons, among other things, and Rokas Gleiser and co-written by Billy Wilder. Wow. The people who basically built film noir after they came to the United States fleeing Nazi Germany are all responsible for this. And it's really beautiful and effervescent and fun and is really one of those windows back into another time that I love to look at. You love, I love looking around Weimar era Berlin and seeing these people having just a grand afternoon. Though it wouldn't be your recommendation if it didn't have a moment of doom in it. <laughs> Probably not. People on Sunday, it's great. What is yours? My recommendation, also inspired by a walk through the city, 
is Before Sunrise from 1995, directed by Richard Linkletter with Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke. And it is the story of a young man and a young woman who spend one night together in Vienna. And I saw it at roughly the same time I saw Wings of Desire. I was in my early 20s. And I can't recall at this point if I had been to Europe at this point or if this was right after I had gone. But it, see, it appealed to my romantic nature as so many of these things do. And the idea of having the conversation possibly of your life in a beautiful, old, eternal city was quite inspiring. Could you imagine what Ethan Hawke smelled like? Did he smell European? Yep. <laughs> he smelled like every guy I knew at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sweat in your goatee. <laughs> it's great. Highly recommend it. Love the series. Start with this one. Okay. And that brings us to the end of episode 16. We wanted to say a special thanks today to Mark Herney and Aaron West for having us on their show, Criterion Close Up, to talk about Slacker. We had a really good time talking about that with them, and we hope to talk with them about a lot of things in the future. A number of folks that listened to them reached out and had a lot of complimentary things to say, and we certainly appreciate that. Tim Lego, for instance, who does the great blog Marvel Presents Solo. If you like world cinema and Slater Kinney, you will be right at home there. Anthony Elmore and David Blakesley both had great things to say. David does a fantastic blog called Criterion Reflections and a really fun podcast called The Eclipse Viewer in which they go through the films in Criterion's Eclipse series and talk about those box sets in great detail. I figure if you're here listening to us talk about Wings of Desire, then Criterion Close-Up and the Eclipse Viewer will definitely be up your alley. I also wanted to say thanks to all of our usual companeros that shared a link to our Suspiria show and interacted with us a lot about that. Grindhouse Dave, Craig Eastman, and the guys at FUDS on Film, Jeff Duncanson, we appreciate you guys listening week in and week out. You're fantastic. I also wanted to say thanks to new listeners. James Hancock, Matt Ernest, Mike Delaney, Tim Everett, Soma Protocol, Brian Sauer, who does the fantastic Rupert Pupkin Speaks blog, Peter Hearn, Salty and Mean, James Vincent, and Nathan Tarantla. All those guys reached out and said they really enjoyed the new show. Thanks a lot. We're on Twitter at Lantern underscore cast. You can also find us on Facebook. We're on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. If you'd like to check us out, one click gets you subscribed. And if you enjoy the show, please leave us a rating and review. We had two this time around since our last episode. Micah Matson and Tanner Gers. we wanted to say thanks a lot for leaving those for us. We put a lot of effort into making a quality show for you guys, so when we get reviews and feedback that demonstrate that our listeners are being just as thoughtful and considerate as they listen, they're putting in just as much work as we are, we really appreciate that kind of feedback from you. If you would like to check out previous episodes and all of the supplemental material for those, you can go to magiclanternpodcast.com anytime for a full list of those, including show notes. Thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 